Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you're a guest, we welcome you to our family this morning. And if we've not got a chance to meet you, I'd love to get connected with you myself after the service. We're in a a series called Thrive, Staying Strong and Living Ready. Staying Strong and Living Ready, going verse by verse through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, looking forward to diving into two verses with you this morning. We're going to be verse 13 and verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I hope you have a Bible. Because we didn't come to hear my words, we've come to hear God's word. Amen? And I'm looking forward to reading the word with you. I don't know if you're, if you're like me or not, but I'm a back-of-the-book reader. That means that I like to go to the very back of the book and skip all the nonsense in the pages and just kind of get the ending gist of the conclusion. Anyone else like that, a back-of-the-book reader? Don't judge me up here. I know it's bad. And, uh, but I love to read the back of the book. I know where the story is going. I'm kind of the same way with movies sometimes, you know, I kind of know a movie's out and I want to go read what it's about, right? I don't like to, I don't like to sit there through the movie and kind of follow the movie and, and kind of get lost. I want to know what it's about. I want to know how it's going to end. Anyone like that? I know you're going to judge me. All right, I want to know how it's all going to play out. And uh, my wife, she's not like that. She likes to, you know, slowly, methodically go through chapters and watch the story and, and things of that nature. So a little bit different there. But, you know, I think about when it comes to the end of the world, how it's going to end, what's going to happen to all of us. I especially love reading the end of the story. <laughs> I love reading the end of the story, how it's all going to work out. And I strongly believe that Paul uh, was just like me because he saw how the understanding of the future provides gospel clarity, which strengthens our ability to thrive. When we understand the future, it provides gospel clarity that will strengthen our ability to thrive, to stay strong, and to live ready. We're about to start a section of this book where Paul gives us some teaching on the return of Christ, how it's going to end. We're going to be in verse 13. Read with me. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Our big idea this morning in verses 13 and 14 is this on the screen. We will thrive when we have the right eschatology. We will thrive when we have the right eschatology. You may be out there and saying, what is eschatology? Okay, what does that mean? (laughs) Eschatology is defined for you the doctrine of and study of last things. It's the study uh, biblically of how the end of human history will unfold and Christ returns, eschatology. And we will thrive when we have the right eschatology. At this, at, at, the, at this point, some of you are probably expecting for me, like many have, to break out my big chart and walk you through my opinion of one of the several possibilities of how the end times are going to unfold and get a whiteboard out and give you the chart and, and I'll, I'll save you the nonsense. I'm not gonna pull out a chart this morning I'm not a good drawer and I'm not a good speller, so I'll probably misspell something and make something crooked, okay? So I'm not going to do that. But you maybe have been to classes or you've seen uh, videos or get a big massive chart of, of all the different ways the world's going to end and all the different opinions and time frames of when it's going to happen. And uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at what Paul defines for us as the right eschatology. Because Paul defines for us in verses 13 and 14 what the right eschatology is needs to be. So the question I have is, how do I know if I have the right eschatology? How do you know if you have the right eschatology? I want to give you two thoughts on that this morning. I have it right. I have the right eschatology if my eschatology is loaded with gospel purpose, is loaded with gospel purpose. Paul was, Paul was pretty clear in this passage that he had a clear purpose of addressing the topic of the return of Christ. Concerning the return of Christ and the events surrounding it, he did not want them, verse 13 says, to be uninformed about those who are asleep. 
I want to read verse 13 again with you as we kind of trek through this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no, bold it, underline it in your Bible, highlight it, hope. Now, the problem with the Thessalonian Christians is they were ex expecting the return of Christ to happen in their lifetime. They did not think they were going to die. They did not think they were going to uh, leave this world before the return of Christ happened. The first century Christians, if you study it out, uh, really never entertained the thought of death. They saw Christ ascend, Acts chapter 1. They saw him leave and ascend up to heaven. And they thought they would see him as Christ said, I will come back in the very same manner. They thought it was going to happen in their lifetime. They did not think they were going to die. So when their fellow believers were passing away and started to die, they became extremely concerned about what was going to happen to them. They were eagerly looking for the return of Christ. If you remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul uh, commends them for waiting for God's son from heaven. So these are people that were eagerly waiting for Christ to come again. They thought it could happen at any moment. They did not think they were going to die. They thought Christ would return in their life. But when they started to see fellow brothers and sisters in Christ begin to pass away, they began to get worried. They thought, well, are they going to miss the return of Christ now? Uh, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to be lesser in some way because they died before the return? Uh, did they who were alive, the ones that are still alive, did they miss the return of Christ? And they began to, to get worried. So he wanted them, Paul wanted these Christ followers to be informed properly about the return of Christ and what was actually going to happen around those events so that they would not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, grieving or lamenting is a natural thing we all do. The biblical word is lament for grief. And the Bible is clear that there are reasons that we should lament. For example, I think about lament over the death of someone or someone dear to us. We lament in prayer when our hearts are broken. Maybe you've been there, you've lamented in prayer when your heart's broken. Uh, we lament when we feel helpless in our situations. Uh, the Bible instructs us to lament over sin in repentance. So Paul never prohibits grief, but hopeless grief. He's not prohibiting lamenting. He's not prohibiting grief, but he's prohibiting, as Christ followers, not to have hopeless grief. What Paul is saying is we grieve, but not in the same way as all those other people who have no hope. Or even though we grieve, we grieve differently from those other hopeless people. Again, we see their distinctly Christian way to express grief. And there isn't a distinct Christian way that we express grief. I uh, think about uh, those that have no hope, they express, express their grief, obviously, differently than those that have hope in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been to a funeral of someone that was an unbeliever, and maybe you've been to a funeral of someone that is a believer. I've been a both. Maybe you've been by the bedside of someone that's taken their last breath of air, and it was an unbeliever. I've been by that side. Maybe you've been by the bedside of someone that was a believer and have taken their last breath of air, and two totally different experiences. If you go to a funeral of someone that is a Christ follower, and they they've passed away, there's almost a celebration aspect because they're in the presence of Christ, knowing you will see them again. And not that there's no sadness that you had to bury a loved one, but there's a different type of sadness. It's, it's sadness with hope. If you've been around someone's bedside that was a believer that took their last breath, oftentimes family gathers around and family is singing songs of worship, seeing the departed soul apart from the body and sometimes even waving by to it as it ascends up to heaven. And there's just a different feeling around it. You've been by the funeral or bedside of someone that's an unbeliever. There's a complete hopelessness. Oh, are we ever going to see them? Where are they at now? What, what happens to them? So Paul's not saying don't grieve, but he's saying we have hope in our grief. What, what is this Christian form of grieving? Christians experience grief but without despair. Christians experience sorrow, but without defeat. Christians experience sadness, but without hopelessness. It's true sorrow and true hope married together. These things don't cancel out one another. We feel the great weight of sorrow. You've been there. But we also feel the great thrill of hope, of hope. 
In order to strengthen this hope, Paul wrote to them to inform them of the return of Christ so that they would have hope. Paul didn't write these things so he could draw an elaborate prophecy chart, try to inspire everyone by his knowledge, or to satisfy our curiosity about future world events. Rather, Paul's concern was pastoral in writing this to the Thessalonian Christians. He wants us to experience hope and comfort in the Lord when we are losing a loved one, a believer. A loved one's based upon uh, the certain fact that he's coming again and that we will be in his presence. I think about John 14, one through three, where Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, highlight it, bold it in your Bibles. I will come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I think about Titus chapter two, as Paul wrote in 12 to 13, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for, here it is, that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and savior, Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul writes, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all of all people most to be pitied. I'm, think that there's a, I'm thankful that there's a hope that goes past this life only. He says, man, if you only got hope in this life only in Christ, man, you are people to be most pitied, but we know there's a greater hope. Paul never tries in his writing to Thessalonica or in any of his writings to give the exact time of when these events will unfold or play out. He never tried to gather a following unto himself and, and make bold predictions of specific times when the return of Christ will happen. Now you've all seen those people that look like idiots out there that try to say, he's coming back at this time. It's the blood moon, he's coming back. It's gonna happen, Y2K, it's happening this year, okay? It's happening now, we know when it's gonna happen. I think about many that have, have tried to make these crazy, crazy predictions. I think about William Miller, uh, after uh, in, born 1782, died in 1849. He's a U.S. revivalist who predicted the second coming and earned a large temporary following of 50,000 to 100,000 people. And they became convinced that Christ would return in 1843. When Miller announced April 3rd is the day, some disciples went to mountaintops hoping for a head start to heaven. Others were in graveyards planning to ascend in reunion with their departed loved ones. The Philadelphia Society ladies clustered together outside town to avoid entering God's kingdom amid the common herd. <laughs> when April 4th dawned as usual, the Millerites, they called themselves, were disillusioned, but they took heart because the leader predicted a range of dates that Christ would return. They still had until March 21st, 1844. And after that did not work out too well for them. There was a third date, October 22nd, but guess what? He didn't return, that passed also. And so Paul's purpose in studying and teaching eschatology was to provide hope and comfort for those he taught. I think about 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So Paul wasn't trying to give a time or a fancy chart or tell us exactly when it's going to happen, even though people try to make bold statements. He just wanted us to know that it will happen, that Christ will return. And he wanted to give hope and comfort through that truth. The opposite of his purpose, and the big reason why we're talking about it today, is that the study of eschatology has for many become a point of conflict. You've got the premillennialist, you got the postmillennialist, you got the amillennialist, you got the pre-trib rapture, you got the post-trib rapture, you got the mid-trib rapture, you got the pre-wrath rapture. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of arguing amongst people. And if you were raised in church or if you're, if you're new to church, there's a lot of weird people in church, okay? I wanna let you know that right now. 
And you hear these things talked about and you hear divisions and conflicts and theologians and professors and academia writing against each other, trying to debate when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Are Christians going to go through the tribulation? Are they not going to go through the tribulation? When is it all going to play out? It has caused extreme disagreement. And it has caused extreme disagreement, sadly, that it has robbed people of their hope and it has distracted people from comforting one another. Not about when it's going to happen, but the truth is it's going to happen. When I was a kid, we had a window at the front of our house and it allowed us to see clearly out into the street. And we would we'd sit out there and we would kind of wait. If we had a ride coming to pick us up, we'd sit out there and look out that window. Maybe picking us up for an activity or a ball game or something. And we'd look out that window with anticipation for their uh, arrival. And think about that with me. As we looked out that window, it would have been foolish for us to argue and fight, which me and my brothers, four boys, did a whole lot of arguing and fighting. But it would have been silly for us to sit out there and to argue and fight about what direction our ride was coming from. Is it coming down the street or is it coming up the street? It would have been silly for us to argue about what color the car was going to be. Is it going to be a red car? Is it going to be a blue car? Is it going to be a green car? It would have been silly because all that mattered is the ride is coming. The ride is coming. It's a beautiful thing. That was the source of our hope as kids. The ride's coming. And it would have been foolish for us to argue about the unknown specifics about the arrival and lose sight of the hope that the arrival brings. And so Paul wrote this, church. See this clearly. Paul wrote this, even though the weirdos in the church world want to argue about everything (laughs) and try to find all senses of disunity, and it's crazy. Paul's purpose in writing this was not to give a chart or a seminary class or some deep theological insight of with all of his maps and his charts and his drawings. No, his purpose in writing this is to give gospel purpose. And the gospel purpose is, is your ride is coming for you one day. He's coming to pick you up. It don't matter what direction it's coming from or the car, color of the car he's going to be driving or the horse he's coming back on or whatever it is he's riding into town. He's coming for you. And when you know someone's coming for you, when you know mama's coming home, you got the house ready, right? It gives us gospel purpose. And the gospel purpose he gives us is because we know that Christ is coming. We can be unmovable, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the gospel. We can be. You might be here this morning and have sorrow. You might be here this morning and have loss. You might be here this morning and be grieving. You know what? Be steadfast, be unmovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because Christ is coming back for you. He is returning and he wanted to let the church know in Thessalonica, your ride is coming. So we have the right eschatology if it is loaded with gospel purpose. Hey, because he's coming back again, I can stay strong. Because he's returning for me, when it feels like the earth is all falling apart and it feels like my world is shattered and it feels like there's all kinds of pain and loss and uncertainties, it's okay because he's coming back again. Gospel purpose. The second thing we see about how do we know if we have the right eschatology is I have it right not only if my eschatology is loaded with gospel purpose, but I have it right if my eschatology is grounded with gospel promise. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, if you notice here, our faith, you say, say, how are you so certain Christ is coming? Do you ever doubt your faith? Me and my wife had a conversation about that the other day. Do you ever doubt your faith? Well, it's just honest. Yeah, we do. It's okay. And you say, well, how, how do you know for sure that Christ is coming? How, how, do you, how can you stand up there and say, I know for sure. I mean, if people in the world heard us say that, they think, oh, yeah, right, man, right, yeah. How do we know for sure? Well, notice what Paul does. Paul bases Christ's coming upon the historical facts of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And by the way, church, those are historical facts. 
So if you're here this morning and saying, how can you believe everything? How can you believe everything? Because there are historical facts that Christ lived, that Christ died, and that Christ rose again. I'd encourage you to maybe pick up a book called, uh, released this last week that I'm reading through right now, by Mark Clark, called The Problem of Jesus. And he approaches the problem of Jesus from an apologetic standpoint. And some of the quotations of things uh, that, that, that I want to share for this morning for a moment, he says, in his essay, Why I'm Not a Christian, the atheist philosopher Bouchard Russell says this, historically, it is quite doubtful whether Christ ever existed at all. The 19th century writer, Gerald Macy, on his work, Jesus Contended, wrote the Gospels do not contain the history of an actual man, but the myth of the God-man. Macy believes that Jesus was a made-up religious figure based on ancient Egyptian and Greek archetypes. Now you say, are those legitimate claims and does that shake your faith? No, <laughs> they're not legitimate claims and it does not shake my faith. Most historians spend little time on this argument at all because Jesus's existence is a settled matter for the vast majority of any historians, saved and unsaved, liberal and conservative. In fact, no historian worth their salt questions the existence of a man named Jesus out of Nazareth. Anti Wright in his 741-page study of the historical Jesus, writes in his preface, it would be easier, frankly, to believe that Tiberius Caesar was a figment of the imagination than to believe that there never was such a person as Jesus. If Jesus was only a mythical figure, the embellishment of some legendary character who really didn't do the things reported in the four Gospels then think about this. None of the apostles would have suffered and given their lives to proclaim him as Lord and Savior. I mean, you're talking children being eaten by lions, uh, men having their heads cut off, being tortured. You're talking about complete persecution and scattering the world, running for their lives. What drove these first century Christians to be so radical and risk everything even their own lives, because they knew Jesus lived, they knew Jesus died, and they knew Jesus rose again. I was watching with my kids this last week about the discovery of Noah's Ark and trying to find it. There's all types of things, and I believe they have found it, and most people believe they have found it, but the, the different parts of it in Turkey. And uh, a lot of people feel like, if I could only find Noah's Ark, then I would believe that God is true. <laughs> if I only could find the ark, then it would disprove all of the evolutionists out there. And I get the truth to that, and maybe for some, but we still got a big question. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. Did Buddha do that? No. Did Krishna do that? No. Did L. Ron Hubbard do that, Scientologist? No. I mean, no. But there's a man named Jesus of Nazareth who did all that. And that man named Jesus of Nazareth said, I'm coming back to get you. And so what Paul says is, hey, have your eschatology grounded with gospel promise, knowing that Jesus made this promise and the proof of the promise is seen in the fact that he lived, he died, and he rose again. Hebert says this on his commentary of Thessalonians, Christian hope is grounded in the revelation we have in Christ Jesus. It is the pagans' ignorance of that revelation that explains their hopelessness. The pagans of that day may have had some hope, but their hope is only grounded in erroneous doctrine, personal opinion, some self-made con concoction with nothing but their feelings backing it. Now you may talk to someone and say, hey, what is your hope after death? And they may tell you some, some weird, 
you know, thing they think about or they read in Reader's Digest or whatever, or some Zen thing they're doing of what they think is going to happen after death. May I remind you, none of that is grounded in facts. And what Christ, is, what Paul says is, hey, there are facts that Jesus died. There are facts that Jesus lived. There are facts that Jesus rose again. We know that. And because of that, we can know for sure that he's going to return again to get us. John MacArthur says it this way in his commentary, the blessed hope of the rapture is not based on shifty sands of philosophical speculation, nor is it religious mythology, a fable concocted by well-meaning people to comfort those who grieve. The marvelous truth that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to gather believers to himself is based on three unshakable pillars. The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the revelation of Christ. It's factual. Jesus will come again. Just like he lived, just like he was buried, and just like he rose again. So notice in verse 14, first of all, he says Jesus died. Jesus died. It's interesting that Paul says that Jesus died. You're looking at your copy of God's word. But notice what he says about Christians. He says they have fallen asleep. You say, what's the significance to that? Well, while other ancient cultures use sleep as a euphemism for death, Paul seems deliberate when he contracts Jesus' death over against believers' sleep. You say, what's the point? Here's the point. Jesus bore the full wrath of God for us dying in our place the full wrath of god jesus died a brutal harsh horrible death for you and for me hebert says it this way it is not said that jesus fell asleep but rather that he died he experienced death the result of sin in all its grim horror but his death brought the death of death. In dying as our sin bearer, he transformed death for believers into sleep with a future awakening. Praise God. In, in our trust, if our trust is in him to bear our sins, and if you're here this morning and you're like, my trust is in baptism, my trust is in the Pope, my trust is in you, my trust is in the church. No, the only one our trust is worthy to be in to bear our sins is Jesus. And if your trust is in him to bear your sins, then physical death becomes not a curse, but more like a sleep. <laughs> How many of you like a good old nap? Come on now. <laughs> Sunday afternoon. I mean, if you're a Jesus lover, you go home on Sunday afternoon and you take a nap after you eat food. <laughs> so Jesus died so that we don't have to die. Jesus bore the full weight of sin so we don't have to bear the weight of sin. He experienced all the realities of complete death. So you and I just take a nap when we leave this world. Then we see in verse 14, not only Jesus died, but then notice a few words in your Bible, Jesus rose again. Paul's point in our text is that our resurrection depends on Christ's resurrection. Our resurrection depends on Christ's resurrection. And you say, why in the world, if you're new to church, I know we act weird sometimes during worship. You're like, what does everyone get all excited about, okay? And uh, you act weird in the ACDC concert, okay? So we'll act weird at church. <laughs> but you say, you say, why when, why when it gets to the empty tomb? Okay, like, and you know, the tomb is empty. Everyone's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because honestly, if there's no empty tomb, let's just pack our bags and go home, dude. Because we have no hope of a second coming. We have no hope that Jesus is going to return. But guess what? There is an empty tomb. So therefore, we lose our dignity when we sing about the empty tomb. Why? Because that means that he's coming again. I love John 14, 9, where Jesus says, Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22 Paul says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, 
By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Thank God for the second Adam. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, who's the second Adam, shall all be made alive. 2 Timothy 1.10, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's why it's the good news, gospel. Death does not separate us from him. If we fall asleep through Jesus, just as certainly as he was raised from the dead, he will be raised when he comes. We will be raised when he comes. Stott says it this way, John Stott. If God did not abandon Jesus' death, he will not abandon the Christian dead either, on the contrary. He will raise them as he raised him, and he'll then bring them with him, so that when he comes, they will come too. Verse 14, he concludes. So through Jesus, highlight, bold it, underline it in your Bible. So through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, now this is the dot connection between, between what is true and what we believe about Christ and the hope of our future and eternal resurrection. Notice what he says. He says, through Jesus, when you become a Christ follower, when you give your life to Christ, we are one body with Christ. We are one body with Christ. Therefore, what happens to, uh, to the head happens to the body. Because he rose again, we rise again. Not only spiritually speaking, as we do baptism, buried in the likeness of his death, and risen to walk in the newness of life. Yes, you are born again on this earth, but you also will be born again one day in the grave. You will be resurrected. Praise God for that, through Jesus. And then he says, God will. So God is the activator of this resurrection. God is the active again in our resurrection. And we are the ones being connected to Jesus. Paul makes this statement as a matter of fact, not a personal opinion that he has faith will happen. He says, it's not my opinion that God will. It's a fact that God will. The same way God did not leave the body of Jesus in the grave is the same way God is not going to leave your body in the grave. Praise God for that, man. And then it says, bring with him. Bring with him. The picture here is that God will resurrect the dead Christians and they all will be following the lead of their Lord in his triumphal train in his return from heaven. You ever sit there and just like imagine what that's going to be like? Like, here we are, coming down from the clouds with Jesus. You know, coming through it, man. I mean, that's a group I want to be a part of, amen? You will be brought back. And so when you put that body in the grave, and you see that big old, I love going to a funeral of a person that's Christ follower. And you see that body put in the grave and you see that big, heavy stone put over the body. I'm just thinking, man, oh, ain't no stone too heavy for God to lift up out of there, right? He don't need a backo. It's all sudden like, boom, the body's come up out of the grave. He's gonna physically bring you back. Now you say, do you really believe this stuff? Yes. Yes, we do. The strength, of your hope is not dependent. Catch this, church. The strength of your hope is not dependent upon the strength of your faith. Your faith, it's not like you're holding on to God, okay? The strength of your hope is not dependent upon the strength of your faith. The strength of your hope is dependent upon the strength of the object of your faith. And the reason we can have such strength in hope is because the object of our faith is solid, yeah. factual, concrete, rooted. Challies in his commentary says this, Paul anchors future hope in past reality. He first points back in time to the historical events of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus truly died and truly returned to life. And his resurrection is a promise, a proof, and a down payment that we too will return to life. What happens to him will happen to us. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd have no hope, but Jesus rose, so we have the greatest hope. No doubt if we went through this room and talked about, hey, are you afraid to die? My, my daughter, Lissy, she's like a deep thinker. She asked us this week, 
are you afraid to die? And of course, I'm like, eh, kind of, like, yeah, like, okay. And she's like, well, I, you know, I just, I just want to know if I die. I want to know if it hurts. And she's like, oh, she's like, what about if you die with like the injection they put in your arm, okay? And I'm like, you mean lethal injection? I'm like, I hope you, I hope you don't die that way, Lissy, okay? Don't commit that crime, all right? Don't die that way. <laughs> Talking about, will it hurt? Will it be painful? I hope when I go, I go quick, amen? Just like fast, no pain, just boom, it's gone, right? <laughs> but... I mean, you ever think about the worst way to die? My worst way to die would be like being trapped in a cave really tight and I suffocate in that cave. Like I, I hate, I'm claustrophobia. I hate it, man. That'd be horrible. I get there's sometimes questions about death and fear around death. But what Paul's trying to say is, hey, you can thrive because eschatology must be loaded with gospel purpose, meaning that, hey, he's coming again. He's on the throne. He's in charge. You can be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the gospel, no matter what's going on in your life, because he's coming again. And it can be grounded with gospel promise, knowing that because he resurrected the body of Christ, he will resurrect your body again. Praise God, death's a promotion. In conclusion, in our passage, Paul writes to the saints at Thessalonica who had lost loved ones so that they would not grieve, but to the contrary, they would be empowered by the sound doctrine regarding a believer's death to comfort one another with the sure hope of future glory to be revealed at Christ's return. I want you to study eschatology. I hope you're a student of the Bible. I hope you dive in and study it out. I think it might even be helpful to have an opinion on how it's going to unfold. Now, I have some opinions, strong opinions about end times. You may have some yourself. I would encourage you to study eschatology and develop some opinions, but don't get distracted by the differences some people come to, knowing that, hey, at the end, we just know he's coming back again. Dive into scripture. Look at some of the context of Revelation and Daniel and some of the prophetic things that Jesus said in his gospels. And you'll begin to be amazed at how much weight is in the Bible talking about the end of it all coming to pass. So dive into eschatology. However, remember, as you dive into eschatology, remember the best eschatology is not the eschatology that argues their opinion to death, but the best eschatology is an eschatology that has hope as its purpose and Christ, his death and resurrection, as its foundation. The best eschatology has hope as its purpose. And the foundation of the best eschatology is Christ's death and resurrection as its foundation. Big idea. We will thrive when we have the right eschatology. Learn to live. Ready? This is going to unpack it. Learn to live. Let's, let's live this out now. What do we do? Responding to verses 13 and 14, how do we live this out? One, run to Jesus or else thriving is unattainable. Run to Jesus or else thriving is unattainable. The only way to know hope is to know Jesus. So if you're here this morning and say, I don't know for sure that my sins have been forgiven. I don't know for sure that Jesus is my savior. Then let me give you a gospel call. Run to Jesus. Because if you don't, thriving is unattainable. Any foundation for hope other than Jesus is no better than building your future on the foundation of quicksand. All other theories, all other religions, all other ideas of how to have your sins forgiven are nothing better than quicksand. Jesus is the sure foundation that you can place your faith in, trusting him to forgive you of your sins. Ephesians 2.12 says this, remember that you were at, this, at that time separated from Christ. Before you came to Christ, you were separated from him, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, not God's children, okay? And strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. First Timothy 1.1, but when you gave your life to Christ, Christ Jesus, our hope. If you've not run to Christ, I invite you to enter into this relationship with Christ this morning. Number two, learn to live. Engage with eschatology, or else your ability to thrive is ungrounded. Listen, I don't know what you're going through this morning, but there's no time for tapping out. Because guess what? Your Savior's coming back to get you. I would encourage us to lean into the truths of the end and the promise of the return of Christ. As I said before, when you knew mama was coming home, 
you got the house in order. I don't know about you, but we did because my mom was pretty strong disciplinarian, okay? And she threw a hard plate, okay? So I'm just telling you, when mom was coming home, you got home in order. And when you live in line, when you, when you engage with eschatology and you lean into eschatology and you know that Christ is watching and Christ is coming, it'll cause you to live a life that's more holy. It'll cause you to live a life of busyness for the kingdom in light of the promise of the return of Christ. When I feel like throwing in the towel, I just think, you know what, this could be my last week to serve Jesus before he returns. This could be our last year. This could be our last opportunity. When you engage with eschatology, when you lean into eschatology, it keeps you going when there's sadness. It keeps you going when there's loss. It keeps you going when there's hurts and disappointments, where there's doubt and confusion. It keeps you going because you know that he's coming back again. So engage with eschatology. And the third learn to give, learn to live is this. Move toward a neighbor or else your thriving is unproductive. Missional urgency. When you know Christ is coming back again, it'll cause you to be, have missional urgency. We have a living hope because we have the promise of the return of Christ and the faith in Jesus Christ. That truth right there ought to make us the most active missionaries in the world. If we truly believe that Christ will return and all who belong to him will be, you, be united with him and all who don't belong to him will be judged and condemned for all eternity, we must be about our father's business. There are people in your life right now that you know don't know Jesus. You have parents, maybe. You have brothers, sisters, you have neighbors. You have a coworker. And you may think, hey, it's okay. I don't gotta share with them. You know, I don't wanna push, I don't, I don't wanna be pushy or anything like that. I'm not gonna share with them. If you knew someone's house was on fire and you did not bang on the door to get them out, that's pretty mean to do. And if you know that you have someone in your life, a neighbor, a friend, a family, it don't matter who they are, and I get the rebuttal, you're like, man, I just don't want to sound forceful. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, it's, it's awkward to talk about Jesus and faith with people. But if you know that someone does not know Christ, and you know that if they were to die, you have no clue where they're going to spend eternity, and you don't tell them about Jesus, then your thriving is unproductive. Because when we're thriving for Christ, we're missionaries for Christ. We're sharing Jesus with people, how they can know for sure their sins are forgiven, how they can know for sure when they take their last breath that they will spend eternity with the Father in heaven. Now you might be here this morning and you might think, well, I have a family friend. They're not that bad of a person. I mean, you're gonna tell me God's really gonna judge that person for eternity? Listen, I don't listen to the liberal theology and the, the counter things that combat scripture. God is a God that says he will judge sin. There is a literal hell and there is eternity separated from God for all those, no matter how good they are, that don't put faith in Jesus alone to save them. So you know someone right now in your mind, a neighbor, a friend, a family that don't know Christ, Move toward a neighbor or else your thriving is unproductive. And you say, our city is so dark. Our community is so dark. Our world is so dark. My neighborhood is so dark. Guess what? Hope lives in your neighborhood because you live there. Spread it. Hope lives in LA because we live here. Hope lives in Burbank because we live in Burbank. So no matter how dark it is, church, no matter how bad it looks, as long as we're on this earth, there's hope on this earth. So give them Jesus. Spread it. Amen? Maybe you used to be a dope dealer. Now be a hope dealer, all right? <laughs> That's cheesy, I know. We say that statement in City Light, come and see Jesus, go and tell Jesus. That's not just a sexy statement that was like, cool. No. 
That's actually what it's about. Come and see Jesus. Go and share Jesus. Because hope lives within us. Amen? Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. You're such a good God.